So um, a very warm welcome from a rather snowy, wintry Sheffield to today's webinar from the UK Climate Resilience Programme. So my name is Kate Lonsdale. Um, I'm one of two champions for the programme, along with Professor Suraj Desai. We're based at the University of Leeds. And this webinar series is, was set up to communicate the findings of uh, research that was funded through the UK Climate Resilience Programme. Um, if you'd like to find out more about what the programme's doing and details of some of the other projects, um, information about previous webinars and newsletters, that's all available on our website. So today's webinar is looking at the feasibility of using domestic rain tanks to build urban flood resilience. Um, but before, just before we get stuck into that, um, I'm going to talk just a bit about the timing for today. So I'm going to briefly mention a couple of items of news uh, that are relevant to the UK Climate Resilience Programme. Then we'll move on to Liz Sharp, um, who's my neighbour here in Sheffield and senior lecturer at the Department of Urban Studies and Planning at the University of Sheffield. And she's the lead researcher for the MOCA project, which is the focus of this webinar. Then we'll hear a response from Lee Picture, who is head of resilience at Yorkshire Water. And he's also the Living with Water Partnerships Board's general manager, and he's been directly involved in this research. And Lee will give his perspective on the relevance and the value of this research for his work. We should then have at least 20 minutes for questions and discussions, um, and both speakers will be available to answer questions. So we'd very much like you to engage with uh, asking questions. Uh, we're using the Q&A function for questions rather than the chat. So um, please add questions as they occur to you throughout the presentations. You don't have to wait till the end. And you can also upvote other people's questions. So if you like the look of one and you'd like to hear it answered, um, as participants, you'll be, you'll remain muted unless I enable you. Um, the webinar audio and the slides will be shared after the event and they will also be available on our website through our YouTube link. Um, if you have any technical problems, uh, please use the chat and we'll do our best to help you. Uh, and just to remind you, the web webinar is being recorded. So just a few items of news. Um, there's some new research coming out of the programme for one of the other projects, a paper by Dr. Freya Gary um, and others at the Met Office has been published on their work on compound hazard events and the implications for the UK agriculture sector. Um, so it's comparing the frequency and duration of compound events um, now with those 50 years in the future and the implications for livestock and potato blight. Um, <clears throat> there's um, the Met Office is, is running a two-day virtual event, um, a hackathon, uh, which is looking at new ways to visualise climate data um, around three themes, so marine and coastal, nature-based solutions and sustainable development at home and abroad. Um, <clears throat> and if that sounds of interest, there's, a, there's a, a link you can sign up to participate in that. Um, and as I said, these slides will be available, so if you don't have time to sort of note it down now, you'll get it in a couple of days when it goes when it gets sent to you. Um, there's another research program called Adapt Lock-in um, and this is looking at the need for policy change in response to climate change, in particular the barriers to embedding adaptation objectives into policy and looking at the things that might reinforce unhelpful feedback loops or encourage past dependency or lock-in and it's comparing uh, three different countries so looking at the uh, adaptive action in three countries, Germany, the Netherlands and the UK, around a number of problem areas. That's just getting started. And if you're interested in adaptation at a global level, the um, sixth International Climate Change Adaptation Conference that was due to happen last year um, has got some new dates, so 4th to 8th of October this year. Um, and this is a conference not just aimed at academics, but also policymakers and practitioners. Um, and I, I understand it will be a mixture of, of online and face-to-face -face events, so worth looking out for that. Um, so without further ado, I would like to um, move on to the focus of today's webinar. And I'm going to pass over to Dr. Liz Sharp, as I said, as the senior lecturer in the Department of Urban Studies and Planning at the University of Sheffield. And have research has focused on how utilities involve the public in developing policies and practices and done a lot of work with water companies and communities often taking a co-productive approach 
for example, to look at the promotion of water efficiency or the development of blue green infrastructure for flood resilience. So welcome, Liz, I'll, I'll hand over to you and you can share your slides. Thanks a lot, Kate. Okay, hello everybody. Let me just get myself organized here. Okay, does that um, look, everyone can see that? Yes. Brilliant. Okay, so um, thanks for inviting me here. Um, Kate, we, she and I actually met as a consequence of this project. We hadn't met before, so um, although she is my neighbour. Um, so I'm going to talk about the feasibility of domestic rain tanks contributing to um, urban flood resilience. And I'm talking on behalf of myself and my co-authors, Christian Sefton, who's also in the Department of Urban Studies and Planning at Sheffield, and Virginia Stoven and Ruth Quinn, who are from our Department of Civil Engineering. Um, okay, so the context um, of the work we're doing really comes out of the changing approaches to flood risk management in the UK. So historically, we've seen flood management as approach through um, flood defense and a sort of protection approach for example, the Thames Barrier or these new flood defences uh, near Meadowhall. Um, since the beginning of the century, we've had much more emphasis on, on flood risk management focused on making space for water. So not only protecting us from floods, but also seeking to prevent floods through giving space, whether it's in the uplands, in urban areas, through sustainable drainage schemes, or through making more space for rivers, such as this pocket park on the sheaf not too far from from me um, and but recently the the discourse is shifting again to talk about flood resilience emphasizing the importance of preparation and recovery um, but perhaps these sort of items of inclusion in flood in in flood management um, don't do full justice to the, the real changes that are taking place or the real shift with those latter two types of um, flood management that whereas flood defense was essentially a technical process um, focused on uh, calculations about what floods might be and what sort of structures would, would resist them, um, both the processes of making space for water and the processes of engaging households and businesses in building preparation and evacuation plans and all sorts of other processes of resilience. It's all about interacting with people so in a sense, it can be seen as drawing on real different, real, very different skills. And I think this is really sort of key to um, uh, understanding um, and, and exploring how um, flood management is happening today. So it's kind of in that context then that we approach this question. Um, and so this, the central question that our research asks is, would it be feasible for household rain tanks to contribute to urban flood resilience? And if so, how could it be done? Um, this work was funded by the UK Flood Resilience Programme, um, of which Kate is a champion, and the specific project was called Mobilising Communities for Adaptation, or MOCA, um, and it was funded for um, kind of 18 months in the end, 12 months in the first instance. Um, so just to unpack a little bit of the, the, the words within the, that central question, urban flooding we understand to be surface water flooding and sewer flooding. Um, surface water flooding, uh, about 4.2 million houses are impacted by surface water flooding every year, and four houses are impacted by sewer flooding every day on average. Um, so this is quite a severe problem. Um, but it's not one we hear about very much because what we hear about with flooding are the um, momentous events when rivers flood and many, many properties are affected. Um, whereas in the case of urban flooding, it tends to be many small events that we don't hear about. Um, and this is going to get still worse because of climate change. And the um, UK Climate Change Committee highlights this as a a high priority for adaptation actions. So traditional approaches to um, addressing urban flooding would be um, more pipes and bigger concrete storage tanks. 
obviously um, the the sort of move to flood risk management and storage um, means that that this is now supplemented by um, sustainable drainage. So in this project, we were really looking at the potential for rain tanks to act as a form of sustainable drainage. Um, rain tanks have long been used as a means of, of water supply um, in the UK as elsewhere. Um, but the potential for being used as a form of sustainable drainage comes because, or one of the advantages of them is that, that they would, could be placed on private land. So they're not dependent on the um, finding sort of space in the public realm um, to devote to storing water. Um, however, the concerns when we first discussed this with a set of um, flood risk managers were, well, the problem with, uh, with, such, uh, with, with the use of such tanks is that they might not be empty or they're quite likely not to be empty when it rains. So uh, these will only be useful, the flood risk managers told us, if those tanks are empty when we need them to be. They will also only be useful if there's enough of them. If it's just one or two, it doesn't make any difference. Um, so we, we set about trying to think about, well, how could we address those issues? Um, if we can address those issues, there are significant additional benefits that might, might um, arise. Firstly, obviously the water supply function, um, but also supporting people in taking uh, in in doing gardening or other activities um, within their their locality um, helps support well-being. Um, and then a third potential um, comes out of work that we um, are aware of from from Australia, where there's indications that people who have their own rain tanks um, for water supply purposes are actually. Um, much more engaged on what's going on in the water cycle in their area and how um, and how it's not rained a lot for a while or how it's raining a lot and what the, the potential is. So we think there's that sort of engagement that people showed with water supply processes might transfer to flood risk management and that if people are watching what the flood levels are and releasing water from their rain tank to um, to, to help absorb the flood, they might well be quite engaged with where things are and, and more ready for flooding, more resilient in other terms as well. Um, okay, so out of those considerations, then we identified um, three sub questions, which I'm going to use to structure the talk today. Um, firstly, I'm going to talk about um, really drawing on interviews with the public what potential is there for widespread uptake of rain tanks and what would be needed according to the public to make a promotion program work. Secondly, um, thinking about that question the flood risk managers pose about um, how can they be empty? What sort of rain tank would, would, could be empty and would it be effective? What sort of gains would it give? And thirdly, um, drawing on interviews with the flood risk managers, um, is investment in a rain tank promotion program a feasible future option? So I'm going to talk about those in turn. Um, so in the bidding process for this, we were looking for a partner who would be interested in exploring this, this subject with us. And somebody suggested we went to talk to Lee, who you'll hear from later, at the Living With Water Partnership. Um, Living With Water proved a very suitable partner partly because the area they're dealing with in Hull and East Riding is subject to quite severe urban flood risk. You can see in the photograph, um, really terrible floods that happened in 2007. This is Daring in one of our case study neighborhoods. Um, and because of that very severe urban flood risk, it's an area where there's a quite significant investment underway. And in an era when one, one could still go and do field work in person, um, it was not too far from Sheffield that was an advantage. Um, the other big advantage that came from working with the Living With Water Partnership is that they are unique in the UK in um, there being a partnership between the four risk management, flood, risk management authorities concerned with flooding in the area. So that's the two city council, or two, the two local councils, Hull City Council and East Riding District Council. Um, it, 
combined with Yorkshire Water, who've got um, sewerage responsibilities and the Environment Agency. And because those were all working together in a formal living with water partnership, we only needed to form one institutional partnership, not several. Um, and the other thing I wanted to say here really is that later on, in some respects, I say some things that might be construed as critical of the Living with Water Partnership. But I thought it was important to stress at this point that um, I don't think, you know, I'm not, I, I would be very surprised if there were other partners I could work with it in the UK where I'd have come to any different conclusions. I think that, um, that the issues that they face are just common issues in dealing with flood risk management in the UK. And secondly, um, I really want to take my hat off to them for firstly, you know, you actually need to be fairly brave to want to go and work with social scientists in a certain way, because um, we, we ask difficult questions and pose difficult challenges. So, um, and I really, uh, you know, the Living with Water Partnership have been fantastic at always being um, very supportive about maintaining a really constructive dialogue. Um, so, um, so great partners. Thank you, Lee. Um, so within, um, within our, our working with, or well, once the project started, once we knew we were funded, we worked with the partners to identify two local case studies where we would focus our work. And we wanted one in a richer neighborhood and one in a poorer neighborhood. Um, and we identified Derringham and built in the suitable locations. They'd both been subject to flooding in 2007. Derringham within Hull City Council areas amongst the 5% most deprived areas in, in um, the country, whereas Bilton is amongst the 40% least deprived. Um, our, our work constituted action research. Um, that means learning by doing. Effectively, the thing we were doing was a feasibility study, trying to explore is, um, could rain tanks be used? Um, not that there was a promise that um, living with water would go and use rain tanks um, after we'd done this, but rather there was a possibility that that could happen. So it was really, okay, let, this is a real chance. Let's explore whether it could work and how it could work. Um, our research was conducted through attending community events, through 32 interviews with um, a mixture of the public and people working in living with living with water, um, some modeling, the runoff reductions, and then processes of interim dissemination, um, both in the two neighborhoods and to the um, living with water board. So moving on to our findings, firstly, addressing the question about uptake. Um, so there was something really wonderful about how residents responded in our interviews. They said they would be really, really very happy to install an emptier rain tank if they didn't already have one. Now, it has to be acknowledged that our, um, our snowball sampling process probably drew more on people who were enthusiastic, but nevertheless, uh, the, the interviewees assured us that everyone in my street would love to do this if if, is it really right? Is it true? If this can, I can make a contribution to helping flood risk management. People were astonished they could make a contribution um, and really very, very enthusiastic about that possibility that they could do that. Um, they were particularly impressed with the idea of a, a rain tank planter like that shown. Um, but nevertheless, they, they, they did have, of course, some concerns. They're aware, as, as we all are really, of how hard it is to communicate with the public. Um, and they were worried about whether it would be possible to get others on board, even though they were um, very enthusiastic to get on board themselves. They were also concerned, um, suspicious if you want, about whether the authorities um, would actually deliver on this? Would the authorities do their pit? If, if we as public are being asked to do something, are the authorities also going to take a part? Um, so, but, but faced with their concern about getting others on board, their answer to how could we maximize uptake was that a rain tank promotion program would need, firstly, free rain tanks. Um, and 
but they also emphasized those rain tanks needed to be under the owner control. They weren't keen on the idea of anybody else having um, some sort of control over a rain tank on their land. Um, they also stressed that, that they didn't want to be doing this alone or just as, as the residents. They were saying, well, if we do something, I'd be really willing to do it if I felt like um, definitely the authorities were doing something too. So if the authorities were putting rain tanks on a public building and I could see that happening, if there were suds in the local street that I could see happening, if there were other things going on that I knew were going on to store water, then yeah, I'd love to take my part and help things happen. Um, and there was a stress also on um, engaging communities through face-to-face -face conversations such as you can see um, Martin Ama from the Living With Water Partnership doing in the, the top picture here. Um, and also through using local community groups and local events as ways to get those conversations going. And the overall emphasis really was, um, if you ask me to do something by myself, um, uh, it's quite hard to get do going and to, to get over all the obstacles. But if I feel like I'm doing it with other people, perhaps if I'm doing it with my neighbors and with uh, a collective set of people in, in the area, if somebody's gonna help me do it, um, and if I feel like the authorities are doing their bit too, yeah, that'd be great. Um, so moving on then to, um, findings about what sorts of rain tanks would be effective in terms of emptying and acceptable. Um, so we're, we're effectively, technically, you can identify three um, types of rain tank. Um, the simple rain tank is the sort of rain tank you might buy from B&Q with an inflow and um, an outflow where you fill up your watering can or whatever. Um, and if your thing fills, then it spills over. The dual rain tank is similar, apart from halfway down the tank, it has a slow drainage um, outlet. And the idea there is that when it's not raining, that slow drainage takes water out of the tank. So there's capacity if it suddenly starts raining. So you overcome the issue you have with most rain tanks in terms of, of um, of contributing to flood resilience, that most rain tanks are full when it starts raining. So the dual rain tank can overcome that issue. Um, and the rain tank planter pictured is an example of a dual rain tank, albeit shaped somewhat differently. Finally, the smart rain tank is a rain tank that is actively released at the point of um, a storm being expected. Um, and this is at the moment, there's a number of um, SMEs that are designing these to be um, remotely released through internet connection. Um, however, it would also be possible to have a, a smart or an active rain tank um, if um, you texted the owner and they went and released the water manually. So it doesn't have to require um, this, this complex process. So in terms of rain tank preferences, our, um, our interviewees showed a clear preference for the simple or the dual rain tanks and all the planters, which are a different type of dual rain tank. They could choose more than one option. There was a clear preference against the smart rain tanks, as I hinted earlier. I think there was a feeling that it would be somebody else controlling their water and that was not attractive to them. Um, we asked them as well about who they'd like to hear from um, in order to um, empty their rain tank. And they identified a number of different um, the, the organizations. There was no consensus, I would say. In terms of modeling and how much impact would this have, um, we modeled a typical small rain tank on a typical terraced house. And we considered what impact that rain tank could have in the worst 25 storms in the last 25 years, so roughly one a year. Um, uh, but we adjusted those storms for climate change and we measured the, the effectiveness through four different measures of efficiency um, in two scenarios. I've only pictured one scenario here. Um, the conclusion was that um, 
effectively the, the simple system isn't very much um it's it's a bit better than the um, no system but not that much better but the active system and the dual system both have strengths in both scenarios um uh, but they have different strengths and if you want to ask a question about those different strengths and what it means um i i believe ruth um, Quinn is in the audience and could be upgraded to a presenter and answer a detailed question because it's probably going to be beyond my ability. But um, but the the different different strengths is the key point there. Okay, moving on to the the final question: Is investment in a rain tank promotion program a feasible future option for urban flood managers? Um. So urban flood managers um, were really like the idea of rain tanks in suds, at least in theory. Um, however, their instinct is that they quite like to be in control of things. So they would really prefer to have the smart rain tanks. Um, and that's perhaps not surprising as they're held responsible for public safety. They also know that they don't feel like they're communicating as best they can at the moment. For example, they're aware that um, there's a lot of people who are not signed up for, for, for public flood warnings in, in that area. Um, but they're not completely sure how to, how to address that. Um, and in terms of a rain tank project itself, they looked at our processes of public engagement and said, well, look, you know, that's great. That could be done, but it's very resource demanding. Um, and, you know, how much help is it really going to deliver? Um, so we're not sure it's going to be worth it in terms of the physical flood resilience. And yes, we know um, you're saying these things about it delivering education, and we do think it probably could, but um, we can't make the argument to our funders for this without better evidence. So there's a sort of chicken and egg situation. Um, they're not in a position to um, start to, to deliver a rain tank project because um, we can't uh, collectively promise benefits it might bring. Another thing that was very clear from the interviews with um, the urban flood managers at Living With Water is that the the main thing they see themselves as doing is delivering technical projects and after all this is what they have been doing um for you know this is what what what, what these organizations have been doing for 30 years or more and um they've had to continue to do that and continue to apply for funding and design uh flood defense schemes and so on even as they're asked to deliver flood resilience and so on as well so you've got a set of people with a technical background who have uh, lots of technical jobs to do suddenly being told they've got to do this other stuff as well and it's perhaps not surprising that that other stuff ends up being seen as a little bit outside of their central activities so a lot of these little projects this is a quotation i'm saying little projects in compared to the other streams in living with water that are more operational and technical but they the little projects take an awful lot of time to understand and to do and to make successful. So there's clearly risks to some of these engagement processes and um, a concern that, well, we know what we're doing with the technical stuff, whereas is it really going to deliver benefits and um, where's it going? Um, and this is perhaps the reason why their current communication strategy is focused really on um, one-way communications, providing generic information, rather than um, a question of um, interactive things. Um, there's an emphasis on individual um, household behaviour change and on the education um, of young people through school. Um, and sort of the, the ultimate challenge was an event they ran, which is perhaps a, a, an example of something they did to try to provide some generic information and um, publicity. Um, however, there is an emphasis on learning, and this is a, a comment from 
um, one of the urban flood managers, um, which really highlights that for him at least, Mocha had um, made him very aware that um, you don't do stuff to people. Um, and he is acknowledging that perhaps in the past there has been a tendency to do stuff to people. Um, but I think there is a real question. I wouldn't say it's a question of guilt, which was his word, but rather that um, uh, how do we support um, organizations like Living With Water to move to a different way of doing things? So future flood resilience requires both the public and authorities to shift, to accept that there is uncertainty. And I think that that's one of the key things about resilience, that we can't prevent all flooding, um, and to share responsibility. But in order for that attempt to share responsibility not to be felt like the public are being dumped on, um, that there needs to be a real change which develops equitable relationships and really enables um, public ideas and public preferences to influence what's done. And that needs some sort of conversational social in interactions rather than one-way communications. And part of that then would be about valuing the social and the technical solutions equally. Um, but I think what I'm saying there really is about a seismic shift in contemporary norms, both in what the public perceive, the authorities perceive, and um, crucially, in the existing regulatory and funding processes. So as one resident of Derringham said, what we're looking for is a basic rethink in how we manage water. Now, interestingly, um, a DEFRA flood resilience review that was published last year said something similar. It said authorities need to promote conversations to develop options for action with the active involvement of the community. So you can see that there is a, a, a movement in that direction that's happening. Um, however, um, they need to put their money where their mouth is. So in conclusion, urban flood re resilience could be enhanced by voluntary emptying and dual function rain tanks. Um, promoting rain tank uptake needs a program of other visible community sustainable drainage um, uh, rain tanks and, and um, things in the ground. Um, rain tank and suds projects could help individuals flood knowledge and sense of community empowerment. But a genuinely collaborative suds program challenges contemporary norms of flood management. And just as a little postscript, um, a follow up to this is we, we applied for funding to start to put some of this into action and it was funded. Um, and so we're currently working on a project called MAGIC, which is supporting the co-production of water storage on, on public and private land in Derringham and Bilton. And in addition to the previous partners, we're drawing on experts in landscape, public health. We're working with Time Bank, Holland East Riding, and it lasts 24 months. Thank you very much. Hi, great. So could we hear from you now, Lee, please, um, about your response and your, your, based on your role in Yorkshire Water and for the Living With Water Partnership? No problem at all. So, yeah, thank you very much, Liz. Um, I have to I have to say, you know, it, it should be easy, you know, shouldn't it really? We've got two areas previously not just impacted, but in, in some in some cases absolutely devastated by flooding in a region of the UK where we've got pluvial, fluvial, estuarial, groundwater risks, um, and they are ever present. You know, it's it's almost like the worst cocktail uh, for, for potential catastrophic flood risks and, and it should it should also be easy in a different way shouldn't it in terms of what we're talking about here quite simply is the use of potentially one of three types of, of rain tank um, and, a, and a chance for um, an individual a community um, and the organizations to come together to actually do something at a very local level where you could contribute 
to preventing one of the worst things that can happen to your home. But it's not easy. And it's not easy, I think, because what this is about, it's about change. And let's face it, we, we don't particularly welcome change uh, very well. And very few people immediately thrive on change, although they do eventually. And that's, that's kind of against the fact that, or, or that idea is against the fact that we have this ability as humans to adapt. And we do adapt very, very well. The reason we adapt though is because we have an intelligence that uses not just our brain power, but our heart. And I think that's why this particular project, Mocha, why it is so important in the way that it epitomizes cultural change and the learning that we can take from it. Because as, as you've quite rightly pointed out, you know, we are on a very, very long but important journey here around how we manage water across the system to create resilience. And this project is absolutely almost a microcosm of heart versus mind. So in terms of mind, you know, you're thinking here, what is the right product? How easy is it to use? What is the most optimal of those products to use? But my heart is saying, as a person that's using or, or might be using that rain tank is, well, why do I need it? Can I actually use it? Do I, do I have the tools to know how to use it? And is it gonna make that much of a difference? And if so, how important is it that I do this versus um, paying my electric bill or paying my gas bill? And I think all of those things come together, mind and heart, in this project to take the learning. Now we're two years on um, from when we first started this piece of work uh, with yourselves, and we've grown so much and learned so much, but we have so much more to do. I think what Mock has shown us is that we've just got some real challenges if we are to create the right conditions to live to deliver for me what would be a sustainable change for managing flood risk. We've almost got this double helix situation. So I don't know if you take two pieces of spaghetti that we're going to make a bolognese with, what we want them to do is to work together to combine and create that final product. And what we have here on the one hand are organizations that have, you know, huge accountability, huge responsibility for, for looking after and protecting our public, providing public health, reducing flood risk, managing water. And we've got our communities who are crying out in some cases for the tools to be able to help themselves um, and be part of that bigger process. But I guess ultimately, we absolutely want the same thing. We're all people. We all need interaction. We all want to learn. We none of us want to feel helpless. So it's, it, to me, what Mocha has shown us, an absolute fundamental part of our project. And it's not something that sits over here. It runs through the DNA of everything that we need to do in the future, is to think about how we engage, how we communicate, how we educate, and they are absolutely different things, but they combine to start to build trust. So since, uh, since Mocha first started and we started to uh, uh, take on board that research, we've looked at what we need to do in terms of that engagement strategy, in terms of the communication strategy, in terms of the education piece. And we've got some amazing things going on in terms of that education through, uh, through school education, PSHE at Key Stage 1, Key Stage 2. We've got a new community hub that's going to be opening up. Um, at Wilberforce College, um, which is in a part of the city that you know we've we've very rarely reached before, um, where we can bring in members of the community and they can come to us and we can have discussions and talk on that one-to-one -one basis, learning from Mocha that people just want to talk to people on a one-to-one -one basis. But we've also got that whole piece around aspiration as well and encourage people to become more involved in understanding and managing flood risk around PhDs at whole university and a cluster of PhDs and MSCs in flood risk. Fundamentally though, Liz, what has come out of Mocha for me is what we're now taking forwards into the magic project that you've just 
alerted us to. And that's the importance of co-creation. This is about working with our communities for the benefit of our communities. And we're part of that community. And that for me is a very, very special place to be going forwards. Thank you. Brilliant. Many, many thanks, Lee, and thanks to you, Liz. Um, so I'm just going to quickly share my screen. Um, yes, so that's, thank you, Lee. And um, we now have about 20 minutes, I think, for questions and answers. And we've had a, quite a lot of activity um, on on the questions and answers. We've got 12 questions coming in. There's quite a lot um, it's, and we've had a lot of upvoting as well. So there's a, a lot of interest around um, behaviour. So, that, so a question got asked quite early on about, do you really think that uh, the end user will empty um, some or all of the tank prior to a storm? And I think you answered that to some extent as you were talking. But I think there is a, still that kind of sense of, you know, you talked about trust in authorities, um, but is there anything else you could say about that, about maybe how they've been used in other contexts in other countries, about what incentives were used? But yeah, something more about yeah. encouraging people's behaviour to actually use the tank. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I guess I think it is a question. It is a research question. And it's a question we're trying to look at within the MAGIC project. Um, a, a, there is a fundamental thing about, you know, would people want be willing to empty their tanks? I mean, in, in our in the research that we did in Mocha, it was clear, or people said, yes, they would be, if they really thought there was a storm coming and if they trusted the person who told them so. Um, but there was, you know, that question about, well, who would you trust? Um, so, so it's clear that some um, people answering that were like, oh, I don't trust any of them. Um, so, um, uh, uh, and so one of our, our plans in MAGIC is that we're going to be working with a little group of people who have rain tanks to explore, firstly, what information do we need to provide in advance about um, rain tank operations and storms and things like that, but also closely linked to that, um, what message is needed when? I mean, how severe does the risk need to be for it to be worth doing what's the you know if it turns out to be a false risk if they empty their rain tank and then have no water to put on their tomatoes how upset are they going to be so we need to get really clear um discussion about what the decision making should be it needs to be co-produced ideas about what when emptying is done and maybe we need messages which are nuanced so people you know so one message is if you can possibly you know if you're happy to empty half of it do so because we think there's likely to be something and another message might be there's definitely going to be a really bad storm could you empty it now I mean there's also questions that we need to explore with the modelers about um, what's the impact of lots of rain tanks emptying at the same time depending how many you had, you know, is that going to itself cause problems in the sewer system? What's the lead in time we need between emptying and a storm? Because of course, we know from our own experience of weather forecasts that, you know, the, the closer you are to the event, the more accurate the weather forecast. But on the other hand, um, if you want people to actually manage to empty their tank, you need to give them some warning. Um, so there's all sorts of trade-offs and difficult decisions that we need to explore really there. I would, I would also add, Liz, that there's, um, and, and Kate, uh, I mean, it's a great question and, and a lot of it is about behavioural change, um, but, but there, is, there is a lot of research going on around that now um, and particularly related to sort of managing resilience and, and water. So uh, Livering Water is involved and, and Liz has been to many of our workshops on this actually um, with the uh, city water resilience framework where we're working very closely with Miami who have a huge risk from a, a, a potential risk from tidal flooding mm. um, Cape Town um, who obviously are hugely concerned about potential drought uh, and running out of uh, water um, along with Mexico and a man in Jordan um, but, but to focus in on Cape Town um, I think Liz during during your presentation Liz you mentioned very much about what they've done in Australia 
um, and how um, you know water supply and demand is hugely important. It's part of their everyday logic and thinking um, when they get up in the morning. Um, that's not so much the case here with with flooding, even though it's such a you know it, it, it's the it's the biggest natural disaster on the planet is flooding, the most recorded natural disaster on the planet. You know, um, and yet the, the the thinking around that is just not in our minds all the time until you have maybe a big event. What we've learned from Cape Town is actually by making some of that data around water usage um, available, that starts to create this, uh, the visibility of the information. It starts to encourage communities to actually get on board, create little competitions sometimes amongst themselves around how much they're using. And that has seen an absolute dramatic decrease in the amount of water that you, they use in Cape Town on a day-to-day -day basis. To the extent that I think that, you know, I think they're probably, don't, don't quote me on this, I need to go and look at it, but I think they're probably ahead now of Australia in terms of their water usage in that particular city. So, you know, there's there's a lot that you can do in terms of behaviour and cultural change and, and enable that to happen. So, um, of course, what, what, what comes across the biggest though is just being able to have that one-to-one -one relationship with people and build the trust and work through mm -hmm. it together. I mean, I, I think that those are really lovely examples because they're examples right. where people are working together with their neighbours and friends. So they are having one-to-one yes. conversations yes. and all yes. with you. Um, and it's through conversation that we make meaning. Um, and I think there's also a thing there about if people are sort of told, you know, do this, particularly um, say property level flood resilience or something like this, do, the, do this to protect yourself. It's all quite a negative thing. It's all about mm. um, go into your little hole and protect yourself. Um, whereas um, help your neighbors do this, do this with your neighbors. Let's have a, a look at how much water can we store in Derringham? How much can we increase the storage in Derringham? And let's have a big um, public water meter that's showing how much how much storage we've achieved, um, and maybe set it up as a competition with the next door neighbourhood or whatever. Um, and let's create a collective feeling that let's take action on this together rather than it being a separate thing. Great. Okay. Thank you both. Um, I guess sort of linking to that is there's a a very popular question here about the role of house builders and planning authorities. So suggesting they have huge responsibility um, and both should in include and enforce rainwater harvesting solutions in all new residential development and standards. So, you know, what, what about that? And also, like, someone else has asked about sort of new developments um, should use soakaways to be installed instead of rain tanks, as these could store more water and require no homeowner interaction with them. So, what, what would you say about the role of the house builders and planning authorities in, in this? Do you want to go first, Liz? You know, this rain tanks is um, is is one absolute part of a, a big picture of many many interventions that we need to make. Um, mm. You know, physical interventions around blue green infrastructure, um, but also policy change. And Liz did allude to it in terms of regulation um, on our summary side, slide and conclusions. Policy change um, is is very very important here in terms of. Um, how we start to um, encourage right at the first phase of building in the future or retrofitting in the future when we're going out and uh, uh, looking at a, a big housing estate that's already established. Getting into the getting into that um, the, the, the policy around um, what the standard needs to be going forwards that starts to enable uh, sustainable change, sustainable use of urban, you know, sustainable urban drainage um, is, is hugely important. We've, we've, we've had one particular project um, that's uh, uh, started to become extremely successful um, between Hull and Yorkshire Water as part of the Live With Water Partnership, where we've looked at putting in a supplementary planning document that talks about a joint, um, I guess, standard that we share with um, new developers and, and housing um, around uh, runoffs and the amount of uh, sustainable urban drainage that they put into new schemes. So, um, and, and that we're sharing as well um, nationally. So th I, I totally agree, you know, this is, this is uh, one part of, of a huge picture of many factors that we need to tackle. Um, so absolutely agree. I'd just like to add there, I think, you know, Hull are doing some great stuff on that because they have created 
um, the supplementary planning guidance, but they're, they're held back by national legislation at the moment that defines sustainable drainage to include large concrete boxes underground. Um, and my impression is that the government are reviewing that and that new non-statutory technical SUDS guidance may be forthcoming soon. And um, I know that Rachel Glossop in Hull City Council for one will be very happy if that happens. Um, so the other thing to say there though, is that yes, new, new homes, absolutely critical, they get stuff on, but existing properties um, are, not, are never, not going to stop being the main place people live. So we need to take action on them too. Great, thanks Liz, thanks Lee. Um, there's a question here about sewerage. Um, so has there been any consideration of the impact of household rain tanks on the functioning of storm overflows or combined sewer overflows? And I kind of like to link that with one that came in uh, during, through the registration process, which was, have you considered the potential impact of downstream sewage treatment works on elongating the response of weather events? So. So any perspectives on how this impacts sewage systems? <laughs> I'll go first, Liz. Um, it's, uh, it's absolutely an area we want to explore further. Um, uh, and we were hoping to do that actually as part of um, Mocha, but we're certainly looking to do that as part of Magic, aren't we, Liz? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I think um, it's perhaps worth noting that that we probably need to look not just I mean, combined sewer overflows don't uh, aren't such an issue in Hull, I believe, right. because it's a very flat area and everything goes to the sewer. Um, but in other areas, I think, and it may well be that rain tanks prove to be more important in other areas where there are combined sewer overflows because of their potential impact on, um, on the quality of water. So, I mean, I'm actually quite enthusiastic about the idea of doing something in the neighbourhood where Kate and I live. Uh, but that's that's a conversation for another day. Great. Yeah, I, th I think the importance of just um, looking back up into the catchment at various blue green intervention, uh, blue green interventions. Um, you know, not just rain tanks, of course, at a uh, domestic mm -hmm. level in in urban areas, but way back up in the catchment and the whole of the water basin. Um, or the hydropolis, as we, we, we start to call it now, um, that that allows you to look at how much water can be taken out of the system. So ultimately, it then doesn't get into the sewer network, doesn't combine with the foul water, and then um, create uh, uh, overflows um, uh, as often. So um, hugely important that we take the, the learning from the work we've done here, but expand that out across um the, the the broader i suppose blue green master plans that we need to build right the way across yorkshire and, and beyond okay great thank you um there's an interesting one here is is communication with the public about rainwater storage for the household level resilience to drought a totally different conversation so i don't know how much the living with water partnership is also talking about living without water but it, it, talking about drought at the household level something entirely separate so live with water is um, its its primary primary function is about the uh, reduction of flood risk, mm -hmm. um, but in doing that we increase community resilience, improve place, um, enable economic regeneration, and ultimately share knowledge. So they're they're kind of like the fundamentals uh, in terms of objectives. Uh, uh, having said that, um, of course, um, rainwater harvesting is uh, a huge part of uh, Yorkshire water specific plans um, uh, uh, to uh, reduce demand um, and support with uh, water consumption in the future. So it, it does go in hand in hand, although Live With Water is specifically focusing on the reduction of, of, of flooding at the moment, um, just because of the, the huge risk we have in that particular area. Mm. I think that it's actually really important to have the conversations together, um, not least because uh, the idea of having a rain tank, more rain tanks, and supporting their gardening was a matter of such um, great joy to uh, participants and, and interviewees. Um, so, you know, given the potential for flood risk conversations to be rather joyless, um, a conversation about, well, this is something which could help save you from, you know, help protect us all from flooding and 
you know, could help water your garden in the dry periods. And we, we were told by our interviewees, Hull does tend to get very dry. Um, we do need lots of water to water our gardens. There is an issue for us because it costs a lot of money to get it out of the tap. Um, so I think that it, it, that we need to have that conversation because it makes sense to the people we're having it with. Great, thank you. Um, there's there's a, quite, um, a specific question here about the use of green walls as in urban areas as well as rainwater harvesting solutions. Um, and there are lots of benefits of using green walls, so biodiversity, reducing definitely, levels. definitely in the thinking. <laughs> Definitely in the thinking, Kate. Yeah, that's um, yeah. absolutely the, the the case. In in fact, I've seen some um, I've seen some conceptual pictures of where we can potentially put up some green walls as well. So it's uh, most definitely in a uh, in the thinking for living water. Yeah, I think they, they and they look they look amazing. And they, you know, you you see quite a lot now actually. If you go to uh, uh, to, to to London, not that I'll get a chance to go to London anymore, um, where things are. But you know, in London at the moment, they they, they, they seem to be springing up everywhere you go um, on some very very prominent buildings as well and, and they do just look amazing they, they look absolutely amazing so yeah they're great for great for changing the sort of the, the aesthetics cosmetics of a place but um have such a an important part to play not just in terms of reducing flood risk but also in terms of air pollution um, and many other environmental impacts so definitely part of the plan yeah great um okay so there's quite a lot of quite technical questions that some might be best to be answered sort of offline. Um, so probably we've got time for just one more question. Um, the, uh, it's, it's something perhaps you could say about the, the modeling. Did you model different types of storms um, or, or, or is it most because there's you know, the river, river flooding or, you know, more intense storms? Um, so because we were focused on um, urban flooding, we weren't concerned with river flooding. Mm. Um, so what we were concerned with were the, the most intense storms or the worst storms, how do we measure worst? Probably the most volume of rainfall, I think. Ruth can correct me in the chat if I'm wrong. I think we looked, um, at, um, we looked at what happened in 2007 um, and 2013, didn't we replicate some of those particular heavy rainfall yeah, events, Liz? So there's two sets, so so there was a set of, um, in our presentations to the public, we worked from just looking at the 2007 flood and one building and one rain tank just as a sort of model of that. But since then, Ruth's done another set of modeling, uh, which is in a sense more scientific, using rainfall data for the past 25 years, taking out of that the 25 worst storms, correcting and increasing the rainfall on the basis of climate change, um, and modeling the behavior of a rain tank in two scenarios, one in which the rain tank feeds the toilet, um, in the downstairs toilet, for example, and the other in which just assumes it's only used for, um, for garden watering. Mm -hmm. um, so um, the, the modeling hence sought to be um, kind of cover, you know, in a sense of the worst 25 storms in the last 25 years is quite a good way to try to represent a, a number of the events where, where issues could have happened. Um, right. Does that begin to answer the question? Well, I think there are some quite technical questions that, that are very interesting. It's just, right. perhaps, I don't know if there is, you might be able to answer some of them offline and we can send them out. Um, I might just share my screen, which has a little bit more information about the modeling. Um, uh, I'm not sure we've got time. Okay. <laughs> oh. um, so there's there's some different the different metrics that we looked at, um, which I I needed the descriptions to make sense of them because I'm not a modeler myself. Um, okay, so maybe we can send that out. Um, yep. Your answers to the other questions. Part of the presentation. Yep. Brilliant. And then the detailed modeling results um, is are also there. Um, okay. Thank you. Um, so I think we've kind of run out of time now, I'm afraid. Um, so if I could just quickly, so yes, just to say thank you very much to, um, to, to Liz Sharp and Lee Pitcher for all your insights and for all the questions. Um, I'd just like to advertise our um, next, next webinars. Um, the next 
when that's so in two weeks time we're very much con continuing the um the flooding flood risk management theme so we've got the next two webinars are also about flood risk management so we've got Paul Sayers from Sayers and Partners talking about event-based assessment of the impact of climate change on future flood risk. And then two weeks after that, we've got Harry Ator and Alex Cutler from the Environment Agency, and they're talking about the climate resilience of the National Flood and Coastal Erosion Risk Management Strategy. So please sign up for those um, if, if you're interested. Um, recordings from today's slides, as I said, will be sent to everybody and uh, a link made available on, through our website. So, it just reminds me to say thank you so much to Liz and to Lee for all your insights um, and for everybody for all the questions. Um, thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay.